Canada already plays a critical role in meeting global demand for food. As the climate crisis plays out and the world's population grows, that need is expected to ramp up as well. A new report says that presents a real opportunity. Not only could Canada expand its markets, but we can also do it while boosting agricultural yields and reducing the carbon footprint of farming. John Stackhouse is one of the authors of that report, a joint effort incidentally by RBC, the BCG Centre for Canada's Future and the Errol Food Institute at the University of Guelph. John's a senior VP in the office of the CEO at RBC and he joins us now. It's great to have you back in that chair. Great to see you, Steve. Okay, the next green revolution. That is a reference to what? Well, some, some of the viewers may remember the first green revolution in the 1950s and 60s when agriculture was transformed globally and we developed all sorts of technologies that allowed us to produce a lot more food and that has helped uh, feed the world, staved off uh, a lot of starvation in many parts of the world. We need an equal green revolution this time, but the green is on climate. Canadians probably don't appreciate that roughly 10% of our national emissions come from agriculture. When you factor in the whole supply chain, what it takes for fertilizer, what it takes from diesel to get that food to your door, it can run up to 20%. So if we're going to get to net zero, we've got to address ag agricultural emissions. But there's a bonus to this as well because agriculture can be a carbon sink. We can absorb greenhouse gas emissions in the soil. And we have a soil base in this country that is almost unequaled in the world. And we've got to put that to work as a national asset and reward farmers as the land stewards for capturing that uh, carbon. That's going to be critical for us to get to net zero. Now, all of this was true two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. What has changed profoundly is what happened in the world last year with the Ukraine war, which in our view was not a one-off. We are going to continue to see geopolitical and geoeconomic disruptions uh, that will affect com commodities trades, that will affect the price of oil and gas, the price of food for many years to come. And that creates an additional imperative for Canada as a major exporter of food to the world to produce a lot more food, to produce it more sustainably, and to get it to the parts of the world that are not going to be able to rely on producers like Russia, uh, as they might have in, uh, in years past. Okay, a ton to unpack there, so let's start to do that. If the mission is to reduce that 10 or 20% to zero, how well are we doing at that mission so far? Uh, we're, like in a lot of sectors, kind of moving along very slowly, and we need to accelerate that if we're going to get those 100 or so megatons uh, out of our carbon footprint of 720 down to 50, down to zero. Now, fortunately, we have the technologies. We know what to do, uh, but we've got to, we've got to scale it. We have the technologies to capture more uh, carbon in the soil. We have the technologies to manage livestock better, and we can, we can get into methane emissions. But Canada can be a leader in this. So it's not just about producing more food with fewer emissions for the world. That's kind of job one here. There's also an opportunity to develop the technologies and create kind of a Silicon Valley of agriculture technology, or ag tech as it's called, in places like Guelph, in places like Calgary, and export these technologies as the rest of the world tries to figure out also how to produce more food with fewer emissions. As you look at the amount of food that we are producing today and, and the need for whatever amount that is, take us 30 years down the road, take us almost, the year 2050. What's the difference going to be between what we're doing today and what we'll need in 2050. We're not going to be producing radically different foods. We're not talking about Franken foods, for, for, <laughs> for instance. We'll still continue to produce a lot of canola, a lot of beef, uh, a lot of uh, dairy products, uh, but we'll be producing them differently and selling them to different markets in the world. You don't even need to go 25 years out. We estimate at RBC that Canada will need to export 25% more food by the year 2030. So that's a massive increase in exports. That's actually a benefit for, for all of Canada because that helps the Canadian dollar, helps our balance of, uh, of, of, of payments and balance of trade in, in, in the world. So agriculture is and will continue to be a key economic engine of, uh, of, 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 of the country. Um, but we need to bring this climate smart thinking to all parts of agriculture. How we produce eggs, how we produce tomatoes uh, is not only going to be important to Canada's uh, footprint, 
we're seeing increasing demand in other markets, and that includes the United States for climate smart food products. And again, an opportunity for Canada to be at the forefront of, uh, of this revolution. I wonder how tough it is to get people to start thinking more climate smart, when the fact of the matter is, what is it now, 80 to 90% of us live in cities. Uh, I'm convinced a lot of people watching this or listening to this have never been to a farm in their lives, and yet you're looking for transformation in a in a sector we don't think that much about. Discuss. Absolutely, we take food for granted and that's at our, 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 our peril. It's amazing to go out to farms now. They are the most sophisticated tech operations I get to see anywhere. You go to a dairy farm and the first thing you will see is robots. Uh, I spent a lot of time on dairy farms in southwestern Ontario. And you sit with the farmers in their living room as they control the robots on their TV in the living room, sort of flipping from Netflix to, uh, to this. And then they go out to the barn and, and do the hard, hard work of, uh, of, of farmers. But it is very much a tech-based, data-driven operation now. So that's a great Canadian advantage because we can be tech leaders uh, in, in, in the world. That can also be a consumer advantage because that can drive down prices, that kind of tech innovation is what drives down prices in all sectors, as we, as, uh, as, as, as we know. But we as consumers need to appreciate all that goes into the production of, of food. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're all feeling and seeing the, the increases in food prices. And that will, that will moderate, we believe. But it's an indication of some of the challenges mm -hmm. out there. We're not going to make this transition easily. And we're not going to make it easily if we don't invest more in farmers. We have to think about collectively about the economics of farming. It's really still very tough to make a living uh, as a, a, a farmer. Even if you've got thousands of, of hectares, it's, uh, it's tough to get by. You, know, you might have a, a commodity spike one year, but it's going to come down the, uh, the, the next year and you still have all your bills to, uh, bills to pay. So as a country, we're looking for ways and policy ideas to invest more in farmers, particularly to reward them for that stewarding of the land that I mentioned earlier. Farmers, we believe, can capture 30 to 40 megatons of carbon. That's almost on par with what the oil sands produces. So it comes out of the oil sands, go back into soil. How do we incentivize farmers, reward them for capturing that soil? Who's the we that needs to incentivize them? We collectively as a, 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 as a country. Governments, businesses. Well, and markets, markets. Be, because there are through offset and what are called inset models, there are a lot of companies and a lot of investors that want to reward uh, farmers for doing that. So, and, and this is already underway in, 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 in Alberta, in Manitoba. There's interesting work being done by big companies like McCain's. So they're working with potato farmers. So you can get net zero French fries or with Nutrien, big uh, fertilizer producer, to reward farmers to change their practices through things like tillage, going to no-till, for instance, so that they capture more of those greenhouse gases in their soil and get compensated uh, for it. We're estimating in our, our RBC research that there's probably between two to four billion dollars a year available in the market to invest in, in farmers. So that comes from the market, comes from companies and investors that are looking for, as I say, offsets to transfer that to farmers to, to care for their land more smartly, use new technologies, but have the, that, that capital, that money in the bank to, to pay for those tools and, and to uh, follow, those, follow those practices. Let's talk disruption. Uh, one man-made, one not so much. Let's start with man-made, Ukraine. What has that done to everything we've been talking about here? Huge spike, uh, as we all know, in commodity prices, food particularly. That has started to moderate, and we believe will continue to moderate through 2023. Inflation will come down, including for food. But we are going to see more disruptions like this. The free flow of goods uh, and food uh, stuffs in the world is not going to be uh, as smooth over the next 25 years, frankly, as it was over the last 25 years. This is all part of deglobalization or reglobalization, depending on your, your point of view. So game on for Canada as a major producer, number one, number two, number three producer in a whole range of, uh, of food products. 
there's going to be more demand for, for what we produce. I got to meet with a, a, a Japanese business delegation last fall that had come to Canada to say, here's what we need over the next 25 years. Amazing how the Japanese think. Right? They said, here's our shopping list. This is how much canola we're going to need over the next 25 years. Um, we really like Canada as a canola producer. You, 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 you make great canola, uh, you're reliable, we like you as a, as a country. We're not so sure how reliable you are as a trading partner. Your ports are a bit messy. Uh, your roads, your rail lines are not as sophisticated as we'd like to, uh, like to see. So we want to hear about your plans for the next 10, 25 years in terms of infrastructure. And do we have any? So that we can count on you for as a 25-year shopper for canola, mm -hmm. for pork. They want a lot of Canadian pork as, as well. No, we don't. And this is a chronic Canadian challenge. We have lots of good policies in place. We have good investments in place, but nowhere near as ambitious and as focused as we need to be to say to the world, but also to ourselves, here's what our infrastructure plan is uh, for the next 25 years. And you know what, we're, this, this time we're gonna stick to it because we're also seen in the world as not always reliable. We'll say we're gonna, gonna build this. And as we all know, it sometimes usually takes longer in Canada than we say it will. Mm -hmm. The world knows that. Uh, we've got to up our game in terms of uh, hitting uh, our commitments. We know about that all too well in this neighborhood because uh, 100 yards north of us right now is an LRT that should have been opened by now uh, and is uh, going to be billions over budget by the time it's done, if it's ever done. Anyway, I'm on a tangent. The other thing, the other disruptive thing I wanted to talk about was weather-related events. We're seeing what's happening in California right now. Quite frightening what's going on. How much more of this is a part of the story you're talking about? The, this is the, 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 the new normal, and in fact, the Japanese referenced that as well. Uh, climate resilient infrastructure is a growing concern. So they see what happened with the, 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 the floods in BC last uh, year they, and, and how that disrupted trade. And they say, you know, we, we're not sure we can rely entirely on a single producer because if you are hit by a climate event, uh, by, by a weather event, and that means a shipment of canola is not going to get to us, that's going to cause havoc in, in, in our market. So give us a bit more certainty that you're not only going to invest in infrastructure, but you're going to have cl what's called climate resilient uh, infrastructure. This is a new challenge for, 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 for Canada, but one that we know uh, is here and it is going to grow. So when we're building, and it's true for LRTs as well, mm -hmm. but when we're building rail lines, uh, which we're not building uh, uh, sufficiently or expanding our ports, it's not going to be the port uh, of yesteryear that we're going to need. The, the port of the future is gonna be digitally enabled, but it's also gotta be climate resilient because it is going to be hit by hurricanes, by weather disruptions. Farmers are also uh, getting used to this, and you know, no farmer needs to be told about how challenging and unpredictable weather is. They know that uh, before the rest of us mm -hmm. do, but that also is a new norm for farmers. Uh, it is going to be harder to predict uh, what the weather is going to be like next year or the year after, and therefore harder to manage your crops through this. Comes back to those economic incentives. So how do we continue to reward farmers for what are called climate smart practices so they are being rewarded not only for what they're producing, but also for what they're preserving. How does that look? Is that a tax code change or what? Uh, well, n n no, it's a offset and inset model so that companies and but investors... That, you've talked about that. Yeah. But beyond that, is there something the rest of us can be doing to incent this better behavior? Well, if, if, if you're an investor, look for ways to uh, in, in invest in this. But if you're a consumer, which we all are, think about what you're consuming food-wise. Think about where your food is coming from. Uh, spend a bit of time. Spend a minute understanding, uh, whether it's a QR code or looking at what's, what's on labels. Where did your food come from? Is it climate smart? Increasingly, you will know the emissions of, of your food. So when you get a box of cereal or a, a, a dozen eggs, you'll be able to see on the label uh, what the footprint is. And as uh, climate smart consumers, then we'll all, all be able to uh, collectively let the market do what it does very well, which is send signals mm -hmm. to the producers that they uh, will be rewarded for those climate smart practices. That sounds like a worthy and valuable thing to do. Is it a luxury people 
will want to consider when inflation's at five, six, seven percent? Yeah, that, that, that's a pressing question. Let's not be naive. People are pressed uh, in, the, in, the, in the pocketbook, and when they are pressed, they, they tend to think primarily and exclusively often about the economic consideration, the price of something, uh, that sustainability is a nice to have or a, lu a, a, a luxury, as you, as, as, as you say. But sustainability also needs to drive innovation, uh, drive those technologies that we talked about that is actually going to reduce the, uh, the, the prices. Those robotic milkers on dairy farms that I mentioned, those can drive down the price of, uh, of, 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 of milk. Technologies in fertilizer, we need to reduce the amount of emissions that come from fertilizer. Fertilizer companies are working on this. Every farmer knows that they pay far too much on, or spend too much on fertilizer. They'd all like to cut their fertilizer bill. Well, these technologies, these innovations that Canadian companies can lead are going to reduce the amount of money that farmers need to spend on, on those inputs. That will lead to lower prices for consumers. Okay, in our last few minutes here, you've done this report, you've done a lot of research, you've put some ideas out there. Where do you want to see it go now? We need Canadians and Canadian governments to see agriculture as a critical strategic opportunity for the country. We're calling this Canada's moonshot. How does Canada produce 25% more food this decade with 25 to 30% fewer emissions? We have the technology. We have the brain power out there to do it. We need the federal and provincial governments to work together a lot more ambitiously than they are. We need the private sector, great innovators right through the food system, to come together to focus on this, this, this moonshot that not only is going to be essential to Canada getting to net zero, it's actually going to be a great export to the world because all sorts of countries out there are also trying to figure this out. If we figure it out first, we're going to be selling those technologies, selling that know-how to, uh, to the world. Is it a problem, John, that, and I, I hope I'm not telling tales out of school here, but the agriculture minister in the provincial cabinet, in the federal cabinet, tends not to be one of the more senior ministers in those cabinets. How big a problem is that? It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating but very big, big problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Agriculture is not seen as economic strategy. Mm -hmm. And this is something that RBC is trying to stress far and wide. A agriculture is one of, if not the most strateg strategically important sectors in the economy. Uh, it creates all sorts of jobs. It's essential to, to, to exports. It actually is a thread of national unity that we, we take for granted because agriculture is everywhere in, 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 in the country. So how do we see agriculture and food systems more broadly as an economic opportunity, the way we look at electric vehicles, for instance, the way we look at batteries? We are going to be investing, rightly so, billions of dollars, collectively tens of billions of dollars in the transition of other sectors like vehicles, like oil and gas. We need to make the same commitment to agriculture not as some sort of subsidy to farmers, but as a way of, 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 of uh, reimagining this sector for the next quarter century as an economic leader for the country. That's John Stackhouse, Senior VP in the Office of the CEO at the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, I guess they call it now, trying to lead the next green revolution. John, as always, good to have you here at TVO. Pleasure, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.